Well, good evening. So glad you could join us. So glad we, we I could get here. I had to give somebody a helping hand on the side of the road, and that took a little longer than I thought it would, but we're here. And uh, we are going to go to the Lord in prayer, so let's ask him to bless the service tonight. Lord, we are thankful to be here in your house. And Lord, I just pray that you would bless this time that we have together as we study your word. Let us behold wonderful things out of your law. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I was in such a hurry that I did not even have a chance to silence my phone, and I'm going to do, do that right now, silence my phone, so that I don't uh, end up... Uh, end up having my own phone ring in the middle of, of it. I've had that happen once before. I forgot to do it on a Wednesday night, and somebody called me right in the middle of the service as I was preaching. I was like, man, it happens to everybody, but that was embarrassing, so I don't need it twice. All right. Have you ever thought, have you ever thought what it would be like to have worshipped like they did in the Old Testament? I, I have. I mean, you think about all the sacrifices that were made. I mean, even prior to the law, you had sacrifices being made. And then in the law, there were all sorts of sacrifices that were prescribed for the Israelites to make. You, you think about that. How many, by this age that you are now, how many, if you were raised in the Old Testament times, as a Jew, how many sacrifices would you have seen? How many lambs would have been slain? How many goats? How many oxen? How many animals would you have seen slaughtered for you, for the nation? And you know, as you think about that, I am I'm thankful. One, I'm not a ritualistic person, and a lot of the Old Testament was very formalized very ritualistic and all these sacrifices that were made they were they were made to to point to something and, and we'll kind of look at that the the point of the passover a little bit tonight last week we looked at when we looked at that 10th play we kind of looked at the nuts and the bolts and we looked at what was what was happening with it but tonight you know we're going to see why the lamb had to die what was the significance of some of these Events and we're going to explore that a little bit more. We kind of skipped a rock over that a little bit last week, but we're going to pull it back a little bit further. And you know, as we look at it, the Passover lamb is a picture of Jesus Christ. And one way we, you know, we can specifically know this is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 through 8. And Paul is talking to the church at Corinth, and boy, they were a messed up church. The church at Corinth was. Uh, a, a really, truly, a, a church that was gifted, extremely gifted, but very spiritually immature. And they had a lot of uh, sin problems that were going on. But he says in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, not with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And so when you look at this, you know, at this study of the Passover, what we have to recognize is that God was, was yes, using the, the, the lamb there as something that was to keep them safe from the, the death angel, but he did it with a larger purpose to point to our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we're going to look and try and try and figure out what are the the parallels, what are the what was the picture pointing to, and and what's the implication for how I'm supposed to live today, because God didn't just give us this truth just so that we could gain information. He gave it to us so we could experience transformation by His grace, and, and so in as we look at this, the Lamb that is supposed to picture Christ. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 5, what do we learn about this lamb? In Exodus chapter 12, verse 5, he says, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. A lot of times when we think about the lamb, we think of, of, of a sheep. But, but God said it could be a, a, a sheep or a goat. And he says, but it has to be this. What's the, you know, it has to be a male of the first year. But what the defining characteristic of this one male lamb? Anybody? What's that? 
unblemished, spotless. It has to be a perfect lamb. It, it can't be a, a defective lamb. And why would, why would God want it to be, well, spotless? Well, well one, we, we shouldn't offer God junk, should we? God should, God should deserve and does deserve the very best that we have. But remember, this lamb is not just an offering to God, but a picture of Christ. And so the lamb was without spot because Jesus was without sin. He was perfect. You know, in, in 2 Corinthians 5.21, Paul, again addressing the church uh, at Corinth for the second time, says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. See, the idea here is the lamb had to be spotless because it was representing Christ. Christ, our Passover lamb, who, who is sacrificed for our sin, spotless. Now, you know, I, I remember growing up, I remember seeing Happy Days. Anybody yeah. know Happy Days, familiar with that one? You know, the Fonz, when he would look in the mirror, you all remember that? What would he do? He'd get his comb out and he'd go, hey. Yeah, don't need he didn't need anything, right? Just good the way it is. Well, the truth of the matter is, he may be able to do that throughout the, the day. He might be able to say A throughout the day because of all the grease he had in his hair. <laughs> but the reality is, is sometime he had to see a comb because <laughs> he wasn't perfect. We all fall short except for Jesus. That's why he came. He came, the spotless lamb, took our sin upon himself so that we might go free. We might be made the righteousness of God in him. And as we look at this, this, this representation of Christ reminds us of his sinlessness, which, you know, I, I like, again, you think of these lambs, you think of these sacrifices, they're pointing to, to Jesus. That's why in John 1.29, when John the Baptist says, he says this, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world here's the here's the lamb that takes away the sin of the world all these pictures all the different sacrifices including the passover all pointed to jesus the spotless lamb who would die in our place by the way as you think about the progression of sacrifices in the old testament and, and or out throughout the bible i like what one commentator wrote uh, concerning these different sacrifices. In Genesis, the lamb was slain for an individual. In Genesis 4.4, 4, we have Abel you know, presenting his lamb. In Exodus, the lamb was slain for the family. Right here, they're all gathering in under the household. In Leviticus, the lamb was slain for a nation. In Leviticus 16. And in the New Testament, the lamb of God was slain for the sin of the world. So you have this ever-expanding concept of the 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 sacrifice that the lamb would make and how far its extent and its reach could be starting with the individual and expanding out to the family and then to the nation and then when jesus comes he's the he is the lamb of god who takes away the sin of the world now and uh, that's i like what he said here but i would like to add to what he said this throughout the old testament you have still had sacrifices occurring for the individual now the the expansion of it shows that he, the the power of the, the the sacrifice of the lamb you know the the lamb that was offered for the nation that, that had a pretty far reach and then the reach of christ's sacrifice the lamb of god who takes away the sin of the world but the lamb it still had to be applied to the individual and so the sacrifice that christ made something that is applied to the individual as well so jesus is that lamb obviously all these sacrifices point to him and so that's why it was important. And you had all these sacrifices being repeated, dealing with the sin and de dealing with deliverance. Every year they were to be reminded of the deliverance that God provided for them in Egypt. Every year they did the Passover. It was a reminder uh, of that. The, by the way, the lamb was to be sacrificed and consumed with bitter herbs and unleavened bread. Look back in Exodus 12 and verse 18. The unleavened bread was to be eaten with the Passover lamb, and for a week afterwards, in the first month, on the 14th 
day of the month at the evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at evening. For seven days no leaven shall be found in your house, since whoever eats what is leavened, that same person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he's a stranger or a native of the land. You shall eat nothing leavened in all your dwellings. You shall eat unleavened bread for those for those days. Now, why, why would that be? One, the Well, the yeast was would cause the bread to rise, but they would uh, you have to wait for that to happen. During the Passover time, they had to be ready to leave. And, and so they were supposed to have unleavened bread. They wasn't supposed to be in it. So part of it is to show the haste with which they would go out. But the other thing is that in the, in the Bible, oftentimes, leaven became something that represented sin. And, and that's what we saw. Remember when we were uh, looking, back, looking back to uh, what we, we saw here in... Uh, in uh, Corinthians, where we were reading earlier, where it says, without the, the, the leaven of, of, of malice and wickedness, the, they were supposed to celebrate this. They, they were to eat the Passover with the unleavened bread, and then for seven days afterwards, they were supposed to have this unleavened bread as a re reminder of the haste with which they would go out. But also, we're told to, to keep our pa Christ our Passover. We're, we're to celebrate as Christians without that leaven in our life, without wickedness and malice. In other words, the lamb was supposed to, is supposed to transform our life. You know, as we look at this, and we look at the larger expansion upon this in the New Testament, there's obviously the thing that when I, when I accept the lamb into my life, then my life is supposed to be different. You know, they were supposed to go out in haste and they were supposed to leave and they were, they were leaving behind the, 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 the slavery of Egypt. Well, when we accept Christ as our Savior, when our Passover land, we leave behind the bondage of sin. I'm not supposed to be a servant of sin. I'm a servant of the Savior. We've been made free from all of that. And so our life should be different. We're not supposed to, to follow Christ while looking like the, the, the world or acting like the world around us. We're not supposed to be caught up in all of the, the wickedness of the world. Jesus is supposed to make a difference. The lamb was supposed to be sacrificed for each family and eaten by each family member with bitter herbs. Small families could join together to eat the lamb together. That, that, that was true as too. But next is 12, verse 6 and 11. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole, whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight, and they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw or boiled with all, at, at all with water, but roasted in fire with its heads, with its legs, and its entrails. You shall let none of it remain until morning. What remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire. And thus shall you eat it with belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and a staff in your hand. So shall you eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. In other words, when they were sitting down for this meal, they were supposed to be ready to leave. You know why they were supposed to be ready to leave? Because when the death angel passed over, they were going to be thrown out of Egypt. Remember, we, kind of, we looked at that last time. So he said, I want you ready to leave. Because this, this plague is what's going to break the back of Pharaoh's stubbornness. And this plague is what is going to break Egypt and say to the point where they are ready to, the Egyptians are ready to throw them out and to give them the back wages for their slavery. All that is happening. He says, I want you to be prepared. I want you to be ready for this. Because liberation is coming. Liberation from Egypt is coming through the plague. But you're being spared by the Lamb. And so as we look at this thing here, this is going to require some faith on their part, isn't it? I mean, why would you go through all of these troubles? Why would you find the spotless lamb if you didn't believe? If you didn't believe the death angel was going to pass over, if you didn't believe the Lord was going to, the Lord was going to go through there, the angel of the Lord was going to go through and, and, and kill the, uh, the firstborn, then why would you eat the lamb? Why would you kill the lamb? Why would you prepare? Why would you put the door, the post, you know, all the blood and all that that they had to do? Because... You see, they had, to, they had to exercise some faith here. This, again, this is the unique, this is the unique, <laughs> um, the unique plague. 
explicitly we're told they avoided several different plagues. Implicitly, we're, we are led to believe that none of the other plagues touched Israel. But here God explicitly says, if you want to escape this plague, you must, you must sacrifice the spotless lamb. You must apply the blood to the door. So faith is there. And, and you, have to be, you need to be ready to leave because deliverance is coming. It's coming. You know, as I, it, we look at this, the, you got the, the bitter herbs that are eaten with this. Why would you have bitter herbs? I'm not a, I, bitter's not one of those flavors I'm really keen on. Some people like bitter stuff. I'm not one of them. I, if you ever go to the Coca-Cola Museum in Atlanta, I've been there. You ever go there, they have Cokes from all around the world. There is one particular flavor of soda. It, it, it is as bitter and nasty as you would ever. It, it's just bad. I mean, it's horrible. And you know, I, I, I drank a little bit. I'm like, who would want to drink this? Now, I don't drink sodas anymore. I gave that up a while back. But I would never drink that. Why would God say bitter herbs? You know, I, I thought about that, and we're not really told. So, you know, this is the opinion light that's flashing, okay? This is opinion, opinion, opinion. Maybe they were escaping the bitterness of their bondage in Egypt, potentially. That's a possibility. You know, and they were reminded of the, you know, the, maybe the sacrifice the, that the lamb would have to make, and, that, you know, that couldn't have been pleasant for the lamb, huh? Jesus' suffering certainly was a bitter lot, wasn't it? You know, he didn't want to, it, it, when he, before he goes to, to Calvary, what does he say? Lord, if it's at all possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. So maybe it points to the bitterness of the suffering of the lamb. Well, the one true lamb anyway. As we look at this, 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 uh, this idea of unleavened bread, again, points us to the holy lives of, that we're supposed to be living. In light of the, the, the sacrifice that Jesus made, that should spur us on. I like what Paul said in Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. And where, where do we most clearly see the mercy of God? Anybody? Where would you say God's mercy was best displayed? What's that? When you need him most, for sure. But I would say that the mercy of God was when we needed him the most when Jesus died on Calvary. Right. Right? right? And so by the mercies of God, and, and that's not the only time his mercies were demonstrated, but I think that's the most powerful example of his mercy. I didn't, I didn't deserve to be saved. It's not because of what I did, but because of what Jesus did. And his mercy in sending his son to die on the cross, I beseech you therefore by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so as a, as a believer who's experienced the, the forgiveness that is found in the Lamb, who's been spared from the judgment because of the sacrifice of the Lamb, then my life, like I said, should be different. When you struggle with trying to do what's right, and we all do, right? Let's be honest. What we need to do is recall the sacrifice of the lamb. That he did that for me. By his grace, I want to live for the one who died for me. And he renew my mind. Renew my mind. How do I renew my mind so I'm not conformed to what the world is around me? Well, I renew my mind by focusing on the word, by focusing on the gospel. It is the, it's the gospel that transforms us, that gives us a reason to live differently because we're not our own. We've been bought with a price. Therefore, we're to glorify God in our body and our spirit, which are the Lord's. And so as we look at this, this study of the lamb, <laughs> boy, it should change us. Change us. One of my favorite stories I, I, it's told about a church, a little church in Germany. And in that, in that church in Germany, there stands a stone lamb, which has an interesting history. 
Workmen are building the roof. One workman fell to the ground. All of his, this is before OSHA, okay? This is before you have to have all the, the, the stuff to tie it off and all that stuff. He, he fell to the ground and his companions hastened down expecting to see him killed. But you know what? He was unhurt. You know why? Because a lamb was grazing there in the churchyard. And he fell onto it. Crushing the lamb, killing the lamb, but sparing his life. He was so grateful that he, he made an image of the lamb in stone and placed it on the building as a memorial. See, here's the thing. When we recognize what the Lamb of God has done for us, we're to take our lives and make it a living monument to God. Pouring out our life as a sacrifice, a, a, a drink offering poured out as a sacrifice of gratitude for the one who shed his blood for you and for me. As we look at this, this Passover lamb and we look at what happened here, it's amazing to think, you know, we, they, they had to consume this lamb and whatever was left over there, it was to be consumed with fire. And they're, they're, they're eating the lamb and, the, and it's almost, they're, they're putting their trust in this lamb to keep them safe from the, the angel that was Passover. But not only did they have to eat the lamb and kill the lamb, they had to apply the, the blood on the doorpost of, and the, the lentil on the doorpost of the house. And apply that. I don't know. That, you, you think about that, I mean, you're painting blood on the, on the house. But where are you going to go to spend the night? You're going to go through the door, right? You're passing through and underneath and are around the, the blood, right? You see, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Hebrews lets us know that. Because almost, almost, almost all the Old Testament sacrifices taught us that the animal had to die and the blood had to be shed, right? There were other sacrifices that, that could be done, but the vast majority that were dealing with sin were blood sacrifices. Is they're pointing to the fact that Jesus Christ would shed his blood for you and for me. And when he was on that cross and they thrust the spear into his side, what came out? Blood and water, right? The water part represents, uh, it was, would come from, I'm told by physicians, the, the sack around the heart that was, the heart broke, basically, he died with a broken heart. But it was the blood of Christ that makes it possible for us to be forgiven. And you have to apply it. Each family had to apply it to their, to their house. You have to apply it. We have to apply it to ourselves as individuals. You know, the households with the blood were safe. And in Exodus 12, verses 12 through 13, For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. We've studied about how that, you know, this is the accumulation because all the gods of Egypt could not stop God from doing what he wanted to do. And we saw specifically the attacks of the plagues that hit specific gods of the Egyptians. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Boy, wow. Where's that phrase coming from? What was Pharaoh's question? The key of Exodus? Who is the Lord that I should obey him? I'm the God who smacks your gods around. I'm the God who does, executes judgment. And no one can stop me, not even you, Pharaoh. And all your gods are useless. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. The plague shall be, not be to, uh, on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. The households with blood were safe, and the households without the blood would be marked for judgment. There's a legend. Now, that means it's not true. But the, there's a Jewish legend that on the Passover night, when the Israelites were awaiting a signal for their departure, there was in one of the Jewish homes a sick girl who asked her father repeatedly if the blood had been sprinkled on the lintel of the door. Not satisfied with his repeated assurance that the servant had properly attended to it, she begged him for her sake to go and see. 
He went outside the door and looked, and no blood was there. He made haste to bring the basin with the hyssop branch and had just painted the lintel and, and the doorpost. When a shadow fell over him, he looked upward, and lo, the destroying angel was passing by. Now that's cutting that close. <laughs> that's a legend. I mean, it didn't happen, but we need to make sure that we have personally applied the blood of Christ to our own life. So if you're here and you haven't done it or you're watching online live or a little bit later, you can't get to faith on your mamas. You can't get to faith, uh, heaven on the faith of your daddy, your mama, your grandmama. You have to apply the blood personally to yourself. Now, I know this is a household thing here, but we are told in, in John 3, 36, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Make sure that you've applied the blood to yourself. Don't trust in your church. Don't trust in your baptism. Trust in Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection. That's the only way. He's the way, the truth, the life. No man comes unto the Father but by him. This is the... The picture that we're seeing unfolded in the Passover. Hmm. Now in the future, after this point, for the Jews, the Passover was only to be consumed by those who were Israelites or by others who were willing to convert to Judaism. In Exodus 12, verse 43 through 51, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, This is an ordinance of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat it. But every man's servant who is bought for money, when you have circumcised him, then he may eat it. A sojourner and a hired servant shall not eat it. In one house it shall be eaten. You, you shall not carry any of the flesh outside the house, nor shall you break one of its bones. All the congregation shall keep it. By the way, all the bones, none of the bones are supposed to be broken. Why is that? Because Jesus didn't have any bones broken. That's why they thrust him on this, through the side. He was already dead. The Roman soldiers break the other legs of the of the two thieves to speed up the death. Well, he's already dead. I don't need to break his legs. See, he's dead. Poof. They poke it. They poke him in the side, and out comes blood and wine. No bone of Christ is broken. That's the very picture. That's why he couldn't break the, the bones of the of the lamb. Anyway, keep moving on, because there's so many pictures. I feel like tonight... We're, we're still just kind of, we're digging in a little deeper, but there's so much here. Anyway, and when a stranger dwells with you, oh, well, verse 47, all the congregation of Israel shall keep it. Verse 48, and when a stranger dwells with you and wants to keep the Passover of the Lord, let all his males be circumcised, then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as a native of the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat it. One law shall be for the native born and the stranger who dwells among you. Thus all the children of Israel did, as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. And it came to pass on the very same day that the Lord brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt according to their armies. By the way, they had been 400-something years in slavery, right? God had made a promise, though, to Jacob, right? Don't fear going into Egypt. Don't fear taking your family into Egypt. I'm going to go through it. They're going to, be, they're going to have some suffering. But they're going to come out a nation. 400 years later, God keeps his promise. God always keeps his promise, not in our timetable, but in his. But in his. As we look at this, you had to convert. The Jews were required to keep the Passover, but only someone who was willing to become circumcised, join with the Jews, could partake of the Passover. Why is this significant? Because the Lord's Supper is sort of the Christian parallel to the Passover, and only a true believer can participate in that. You know, when we when we take partake of the Lord's Supper, you know, you know what? When they did the Passover, and they would this was instituted every year. It was the start. This was in their first. The, he says, "This is a new month to you. This is, becomes the first month for you." And it wasn't the first month of the year on the the lunar calendar. It wasn't the first month, but it was to be their first month of their religious calendar because this is deliverance this is this is mercy this is this is where it starts this is where they become an, a nation and, and they come out a free nation this is deliverance all this is wrapped up this is the most important thing for them as jews 
And they, they will do the Passover to remember it year after year. They do it once a year to remember God's deliverance, bringing them up out of Egypt. We do the Lord's Supper. We don't have a, you know, we don't have a schedule where we only do it once a year. So sometimes we do it uh, two or three times a year. Some places do it more, some, whatever. There's not really a specific, specific, <laughs> specific time you have to do it. I know I had a teacher that would argue otherwise. But there's not a specific saying that you only do it so many times a year or once a year. However, this oft, as oft you do, do in remembrance of me. When we partake of the Lord's Supper, you know what we're doing? We're remembering deliverance through the death of the Lamb. But we're, that's, that's the picture. But it's something that's only for believers. In Matthew 26, 26 through 29, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now again until that day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So his disciples there, they dismissed Judas before this took place because Judas is not a true disciple. And he says, We will do this again when we sit in my father's kingdom so this is it's something for believers i remember as a kid before i got saved i remember sitting through the lord's supper and i was a kid i didn't have any clue what it was all i knew was grape juice looked good can i have some of that no why not you're not you're not you're not ready for this it's juice i'm ready for juice what do you mean i'm not ready for juice i'm a kid i'm always ready for juice i'm always thirsty Especially I'm sitting here and I'm bored, you know. Crushed up crackers? I mean, okay. I'll, I'll take a snack. It's not much. They had no clue what that meant. Had none. My parents were like, you're not ready for this. And I wasn't. I had no, no clue what it meant. And I didn't have a right to partake of it. I had not yet put my faith. Wasn't ready to. I was too young. But I had not yet put my faith precious lamb of God who came to take the sin of the world so that's the that's the, the kind of the Christian parallel to this I'm thankful I'm thankful for a God who loved me enough sent his son to redeem me who took the punishment that I deserved who made it possible for me to escape eternal damnation when, when God looks at me, you know what he sees? He doesn't see my sins, which are legion. You know what he sees? He sees the blood of Jesus. That's what he sees. He sees me in Christ. And his judgment will pass over me. I've been delivered from the bondage of sin. I've been delivered from the punishment of sin. One day I'll be delivered from the very presence of sin. No, I need to live differently because of that, right? I mean, I, there should be something different because life's not my own. By His grace, uh, I may not live up to that ideal all the time, and I still don't. That's why I needed redemption, because I'm not perfect. But I have been changed. Because you can't have received the Lamb into your life without there being a difference. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things passed away. Behold, all things become new. Let's tonight. I hope you've had a chance to look at the Lamb a little bit and consider what God has done for you. Know that He loves you. Let that motivate you to live for the one who died for you. We're not our own, we've been bought with a price. Let's glorify God, let's worship Him, let's adore Him, let's, let's remember Him and make our lives a living monument to Him by his grace for his glory let's pray lord thank you for your many blessings thank you for this picture that you provide so many pictures you provided throughout the old testament to point to the one great sacrifice that your son would make as beautiful as the picture is here the reality of what your son did is even greater forgive us where we fail you strengthen us to, to do better as believers may we May we worship you, may we adore you, may we be different by your grace. 
Lord, if there's someone watching now, whether they're here or online, and they've come to realize they've never accepted Christ as their Savior, I pray even now they would admit that they're a sinner in need of a Savior. They would put their faith not in any religion, not in any religious um, act, not in going to church, not in being good, but put their faith and trust in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, his shed blood for their life. They would believe that he is the crucified and risen Lord and Savior, and they would turn from their unbelief and from their sin and ask for grace to be saved. They would call out in faith, even now praying in a prayer something like this, Lord, I know I'm a sinner, and I believe that Jesus died for me, and he was buried and rose again. Please forgive me my sins. Be my Lord and Savior. Help me to, to live for you, the one who died for me. Be my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you're watching online and you pray, just prayed that prayer or you have questions about that, please message us on Facebook so that we can be happy to talk with you and, 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 and just celebrate either what you've done or, or answer any questions that you might have what you, with regard to what you need to do. At this time, we're going to take some time here to, to pray and to share prayer requests. And then I want to encourage you at home to pray as well and ask God to, to meet whatever needs you are aware of in the church or in your own life. And and turn them over to him as well as taking maybe some time to praise him for who he is and for what he's done. Thanks for watching and good night and God bless.